Thank you so much for coming. It's a great event, a great day. I have to say the debate back and forth just seems so healthy and reasonable, and I, I enjoy it tremendously. So thank you all for doing that. Thanks for being here. This is our 13th or 14th, I don't know, but we keep doing them, and they, they seem successful. But tonight, I hope so. Where's Sebastian? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought you cut out. So tonight, we're very happy to have Sebastian Edwards talk about inflation in Latin America. We haven't focused enough on Latin America, so we'll hear about Chile, especially, and other countries in, in our neighborhood. So thank you, Sebastian. Okay. Thank you, John. Well, thank you, John, and, uh, John Taylor and John Cochran for inviting me. Um, this is the 13th uh, um, uh, meeting of this conference. I think I've been to either six or seven. And I, I keep learning a lot, and, and I think that today's uh, conference was uh, absolutely uh, terrific. Um, and uh, what uh, John, when John called me, um, someone said this morning, I think Rich uh, Clarida, I, I immediately said, I will come and I will talk about inflation in Latin America. And then um, John found out that my new book on Chile had just, which some of you took out uh, copies, it's actually being released next week uh, by Princeton. And he said, well, why don't you talk about Chile? And I said, well, Chile is in Latin America, so I think that we can merge uh, the two topics. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide my remarks into two parts. I'm going to start talking about uh, Latin America in general and of course inflation in Latin America, and then I will switch uh, or, or zoom into Chile, um, which uh, is, um, or was, or is, I'm gonna argue that Chile is the uh, brightest star in Latin America, and it is the brightest star in Latin America thanks to the market reforms uh, that were uh, implemented with the um, help of the Chicago boys. And there is a link to Hoover through Milton. And I will talk about that um, uh, uh, during my, my presentation. Uh, Latin America has a really bad reputation when it comes to inflation. And I'm going to show you that as we speak, it's not that deserved. Latin America has uh, been doing uh, quite okay when it comes to inflation uh, recently. So here are the data on um, uh, every Latin American country. Every, uh, I don't have the Caribbean, so it's just Latin America with two exceptions, Argentina and Venezuela, which in terms of the alphabet, they are the first and the last. Uh, and they are not here because they don't, they, they are just too high. So Argentina, <laughs> Argentina has 110% inflation, 110. So it would be in the high inflation in Peter Blair's uh, presentation this morning. And um, Venezuela has like 400% inflation, but we don't believe in those data, so we don't know what the rate of inflation is in Venezuela. Now, the rest of the countries are in this graph, and the yellow bars are countries that have, as we speak, an inflation rate below the United States. This is the first time in my career, and I look very young, but I am not that young, <laughs> and so my career is a very long one, this is the first time in my career when uh, Brazil has a lower inflation rate than the United States. And the, make, the, ma the basic reason for that is that it has an independent central bank and it is run by a UCLA graduate. We trained him well, <laughs> and uh, Roberto Campos Neto. Um, and President Lula wants to get rid of him. And Roberto is uh, uh, standing firm and uh, will not um, allow or, or will not step down. Uh, they may want to change the law, um, uh, but it will be a, a big scandal. Now, the, what is interesting about the six countries that have lower inflation than the US is what unifies them? What do they have in common? Let me, let me before that say, those that don't have inflation as high, um, as low as the US, don't have major inflation. Only a few of them have uh, two digits and it's coming down. As I said this morning when I asked a question to Peter Blair, Chile had 13% and uh, two days ago the new uh, data for April uh, were announced and it's now 9.9. .9. So it made it to one digit inflation, right? Um, so, but what do these yellow bars countries have in common? Um, they have incredibly high interest, real interest rates. 
and they follow the Taylor rule in a very strict fashion. And it's not, like Jim said, a generous uh, uh, Taylor rule. It's actually a strong uh, uh, Taylor rule. So um, <clears throat> let me give you the numbers. Um, uh, Brazil, real interest rate, policy rate, using the uh, ongoing inflation to subtract from the policy rate, the real rate is 9.5%. 9.5%. That's not our star. It's not going to be the steady state, but this is what they have current. And that's why Lula wants to get rid of Roberto Campos. And this is one of the reasons why Brazil has 4.6 rate of inflation right now and has had an incredibly stable exchange rate, which if you remember in the past when John was uh, at the Treasury, and uh, was Lula was elected for the first time, Brazil's currency was de depreciating very fast every year. Um, Bolivia has a 2% uh, real uh, interest rate, Costa Rica 4%, Ecuador 6%, and Paraguay 3%. The other feature that these countries have, not all of them, but many of them, is that they don't have a currency of their own. They use the dollar. And the one country that does have a currency of their own, or one of them that is interesting, is Bolivia, which is a country that many of you don't even, cannot even place very accurately on the map, but it has a very interesting feature, which is it has the third de uh, research deposits of lithium in the world. And lithium is a big deal right now. So Bolivia, you may not know where it is, but I know for a fact, because Chile has the second largest deposit, that the Chinese companies, lithium companies, are rounding Bolivia nonstop, and they are making all sorts of offers to the government. So Bolivia has a fixed rate and a rate of inflation that is 2.2%. But, this is the interesting part for us economists, it is facing a speculative attack on the currency and our models, remember our models on speculative attacks that sort of got out of fashion because very few countries have fixed exchange rate, we are going to be able to apply it again to Bolivia. Those are the international reserves of Bolivia. They went from, 20, from $14 billion, which is a lot of money for a small, poor country like Bolivia, to about $300 million. And any day now, it's going to be a big devaluation and a currency crisis, and how has the Bolivian, which is a left-leaning government in Latin America, how has Bolivia dealt with this issue badly? The first thing that they did is that they nationalized the pension funds, the private accounts from pensions, and forced the pension funds that had diversified portfolios, and they had adopted this following the Chilean very uh, highly respected and admired uh, pension system, they forced the pension funds to sell all their international stocks and buy government paper. And now they decided to sell all the gold that the central bank holds in its uh, balance sheet. So if you look at the asset side, you have gold and SDR, special drawing rights. You cannot sell the SDRs, or you can in principle, but really no one is going to buy them. So they are selling all the gold to keep, and f but the, the, the devaluation will come, and those of us who uh, really like these devaluation spe speculative attack models will see, uh, we'll once again, we'll be able to tease them and we will have Bolivia as a case. So what are the big issues in terms of inflation in Latin America before I move to the case, uh, the case of Chile? Um, one question is, of course, the, what we have been discussing here, our star. And as I showed you, uh, the, the, the most Latin American in, uh, central banks, and many of them being independent, have had no problem. They understood the Taylor rule. They understood that uh, the parameters had to be different. Instead of 1.5, maybe they should be 2 or 2.5 in front of the divergence between the target rate and uh, actual inflation. Their target rate is not quite 2%. It's, uh, three or to four, but it's really low compared to what it was historically. So first question is how high should the interest rate be? Then Argentina is going through to dollarize or not to dollarize. Once again, we had that discussion back in the late 2000s when John uh, was at the, at the Treasury, um, and I think that correctly, uh, John and, and the IMF with, uh, I, I don't know if uh, John Lipsky was there at the time, but uh, Ann Krieger, very tough with Argentina. 
and much more supportive of Brazil and Uruguay at that, at that time. Argentina is again thinking about dollarizing. And the question is if they do at what exchange rate? Now you would say the market rate. Well, they have several, multiple exchange rates. They have six different exchange rates, right? And the, 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 the uh, spread between the sort of uh, market determined and the official rate, which is the export rate, the rate at which exporters have to sell their dollars to the government, it's one to two. It's almost 500 the free, and the other one is 260. So your former colleague, John, um, Carlos Rodriguez, who is a great economist, has just sent a, a tweet. He's in, on, on Twitter now very actively, uh, uh, like Larry Summers and Paul Krugman, uh, but in Espanol. And he says, if Argentina sells all its gold, uh, uh, the government can give, or the central bank, can give 80 USDs, US dollars, to every Argentine so that they can start a life under the dollar as a currency, uh, which $80 is not much. So as you can see, the question is at what rate to dollarize or not to dollarize. But Argentina is, but now we have Ecuador, which is dollarized. El Salvador, which is dollarized, and it has Bitcoin as the other official uh, 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 currency. And of course, Panama has been uh, dollarized uh, since, uh, uh, since uh, um, uh, 19, uh, 1904. Now, one issue that we didn't discuss at all, because we did, as, as John and I were talking, we did not focus too much on open economy issues during this conference. In Latin America, the pass-through coefficient is a big, big issue. If the exchange rate gets uh, depreciates, uh, how much of that is passed through into, uh, onto prices, and that of course affects inflation. And a discussion that people have in Latin America all the time, which we sort of touched on, is should we add the exchange rate to the Taylor rule as an additional term? And the deviation between the exchange rate and the, uh, the, the, the exchange rate that would be supported by fundamentals um, or equilibrium of however you want to uh, look at it. And I think that many of us have concluded that already the exchange rate comes into the Taylor rule as it is because, of course, through the pass-through, it's incorporated in the actual rate of inflation, and adding it as an additional term would make things more complicated and more difficult to, uh, to explain and to, and to uh, transmit uh, to people. The issue of capital and exchange controls has sort of been dormant, and most countries now have uh, fairly high capital mobility, exception, of course, being Argentina and Venezuela. But in Chile, you can walk into a bank and ask for, uh, I want to buy uh, $3 million and get them transferred to John Taylor. I would have to give them my details because of, um, of, of a drug uh, to trafficking and so on and so forth. I would have to give them my tax number and my address and whatever. But I could move $3 million with uh, absolutely no problems. But the, the capital controls issue will come back again. The IMF has moved uh, since uh, John Lipsky left to become more sympathetic towards capital controls, um, and I think that, that that's an issue that will come. A very interesting question is remittances and monetary policy. So I just wrote the 10th uh, year, every 10 years, uh, evaluation of the Central Bank of Guatemala, and their only issue is we monetize these remittances that are 15% of GDP. And they they cannot sterilize them because it's, I mean, in three years, you already have sterilized 45% uh, of GDP. And th this, of course, puts pressure on the exchange rate that appreciates in real terms, and then exporters get really, really mad. And it's very difficult to convince the Guatemalans that this is the new state of the world. And now that um, uh, <clears throat> the border here in the U.S. is being opened, more Guatemalans are coming in. They're going to send more money to the country and that pressure. But this is an issue that um, no one in the advanced world or very few people think about. And it's very important in a number of Latin American countries. And of course, an issue is the revival of MMT, uh, which um, it's uh, Lula sort of uh, 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 flirts with it. Um, Argentina is under MMT. And um, I will, I'll, take a, I'll talk a little bit more about it. So let me now move to the Chilean part of my uh, presentation. Uh, and it's a fascinating uh, case study. And uh, the Chicago Boys, uh, and this is the book, the Chicago Boys um, uh, put together a truly revolution. And they transformed a 
very mediocre country into the brightest star uh, in the Latin American sky. And, um, and you can see here the rate of growth. The thickest line is Chile in, uh, 19, uh, in the uh, uh, mid-80s and even in the late 80s, which is very important. That's when the dictatorship, the 17-year dictatorship led by General Pinochet came to an end. Chile had the, an identical income per capita in PPP to Ecuador and Costa Rica. Today, income per capita in Chile is twice higher than Ecuador, twice, and 50% higher than Costa Rica. And this is a true miracle, and it was built on the basis of market reforms, privatization, wholesale, the opening up of the economy, import tariffs in Chile for all practical purposes right now are zero, um, uh, the private uh, pension fund, and the using the market at almost every le level, and this is why and this is controversial, I don't want to get into this, I label it as a neoliberal model without using the word neoliberal in a, um, in, in a, bad, in a bad sense. It's acquired a very bad reputation as a word. I just say, that's the, I'm going to describe it as using markets at every possible level. That's what Chile did, and that's what's behind this uh, miracle. Poverty headcount, it went from 56% to 6% percent of the population living below the poverty line. <clears throat> Unemployment, it basically right now it's about 7%, 8%. And inflation, uh, it went up because of the pandemic. Chile is the country that had the greatest reaction in terms of fiscal uh, support, um, but in, it's now coming down. Before the pandemic, inflation was about 2.5%. Okay, <clears throat> so it made the transition. So let me talk now because John asked me about inflation, Chile and inflation. Now, this is the team. These are the people who revolutionized Chile. So on the left, you can see um, Al Harberger, who has a good, very, he's a personal friend of all of us. Um, Al is going to be 99 this year. And I told him, we're going to go and celebrate your birthday in June. And he said, no, this year, we'll, I'll skip it. Come back next year for my 100th <laughs> anniversary. And that's what we will do. And these other guys are all the Chicago boys. And uh, the one on the left uh, is Sergio de Castro, and he's also here with, uh, with Al Harburger. And here is Milton, who was behind everything. This is Milton in Chile in his second visit. He visited Chile twice. He went in 1975 and in 1981. In 75, he went with Al Harburger. Um, um, and uh, he uh, visited with Pinochet for, ha for 45 minutes. And that haunted him for the rest of his life. And the left really took it on him. The reason he was attacked when he received the Nobel Prize and uh, there were people in the audience that shouted uh, and tried to close the, the, the whole um, event were the people that were complaining because he had visited with Pinochet. In that first visit, he, and I'm going to get back to that, he recommended a shock treatment to deal with inflation. And people like Naomi Klein and, and even Joe Stiglitz, who used to be here at Stanford, at, at least for a little while, Paul Krugman, who also used to be here at Stanford, they have criticized Friedman because of the shock treatment in Chile. Second time Milton went to Chile was in 1981, when Chile was trying to bring inflation down, the final step to defeat inflation and bring it to one digit, and it failed. And I'm going to talk about that. Now, as a parenthesis, during that time, John Lipsky lived in Chile and almost ran the country. He was the IMF. <laughs> he was the IMF resident, uh, uh, the res rep, resident res uh, representative. And so anything that, so Chile had a very, uh, two or three programs with the IMF. So anything that was major, they had to ask John Lipsky for permission. And uh, there are many anecdotes about John Lipsky in Chile, but I'm not going to tell them here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So let me show you Chilean inflation. This is Chilean inflation. And what I've done here, this is not year, this is not 12 month inflation. This is six months inflation annualized, which has become quite popular in the last uh, few months to dis discuss US inflation. So this is six months inflation, and it peaks at 1600%. Okay, so this is pretty much hyperinflation. 
Um, but it is divided into all of these groups. And there's a final uh, inflation targeting comes after F at the end. And that's what allows Chile to go back to, uh, to, uh, through, to go to 3% inflation. So the first segment, the first period, A, it's also related to Milton Friedman. It's, I would describe it, it's fully indexation, full backward looking indexation with a monetary policy that accommodates whatever inertia there is. And you may not, don't know this, but Milton Friedman became enamored of indexation when Brazil put it in place big time in the 1960s. And here at the archive, uh, the Friedman archive, there, is, uh, there are cassettes that Milton used to uh, tape and they were distributed uh, by some syndicate uh, at uh, was based in Chicago to business people. It was like instead of writing a newsletter, he would tape a program and, and there is one on Brazil and, uh, and indexation and he was fascinated. And inflation during this first period was about 20% on average. Right? And everything was indexed and every so many, uh, about once a year, maybe eight months, every, every price, every contract was adjusted by past inflation. And it was sort of stable at 20%. The problem with this system, also the exchange rate, the problem with this, this type of, uh, of, of, of regime is that it has no anchoring. And, and, and any shock brings you to a different plateau. The second case, the second area, the second uh, period B, this is when the socialist government comes. And this is MMT big time with nationalization, with expropriation. This is when the Allende government, Salvador Allende, the socialist president, nationalized the copper mines that were owned by Kennecott and Anaconda, the two large mining uh, 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 multinationals based here in the US. And they decided that we, they were going to compensate them. And compensation was going to be based on book value in 1955. And this was 1970. But then they said, but we're going to subtract from book value um, excessive profits. And what they did is that they went out and calculated using also, uh, and, and, and I, I mean, I haven't found actually the, the actual report. They calculated a rate of returns in the other mining operations that they had. And they decided anything above 10% is excessive. And they did the calculation. And at the end, it turns out that the mining companies, American, owed money to Chile. <laughs> so compensation was negative. And inflation went to 16%. The third period, C, uh, this is um, a very interesting period, which is a uh, mon money targeting with f f huge fiscal dominance. So what happened? What's the story? The military take over, and they run into an economy that uh, there's shortages, black market. There are 10 exchange rates, 10. Not like Argentina right now, six, 10 different exchange rates. The, uh, the, the highest was 3,000 escudos to the dollar. The lowest one was 15. Okay, so that was the gap. And you can imagine what you do when that happens. You try to bribe the customs guy so that you pay 15, and then it's for a 3,000 uh, uh, exchange rate. But the military ran into it, this, and there are all these firms, companies, that have been nationalized by the socialists. Now the, they are run by the military. And they don't want to sell them. They don't want to get rid of them. The military in general are not very pro-market. At least these were military, these were people that were, had been trained in Prussia originally, and that was their tradition. And when Milton comes, he comes at the end of, of C. When he comes, inflation is stuck at 400%. And he finds out that the problem is that the central bank is financing the losses from these companies that now instead of being run by the communists, are being run by generals and coroners and admirals. Okay? And they love to, they, now they own a steel mill. And they own the brewery. Or they run, uh, the government of Chile, but they, it's run by the military. And huge losses. And this is when Milton said, we need to get the shock treatment. And that's what happens. And that's the shock treatment that Milton says at the end of C. And inflation comes down, as you can see, fairly quickly, but it gets stuck at 30%. And that's when Chile, then there is a change in strategy, and Bob Mandel and Harry Johnson take over from Milton intellectually, and Chile fixes the exchange rate. Okay? 
And you can see the exchange rate here. It goes, this is when John Lipsky was living in Chile and running the country at first. It is devalued little by little. It's devalued. No, this is at first, at 77. So there's mini devaluations. So inflation is going on at, I don't know, 200% per year. The nominal exchange rate is devalued at 200 or 190 or 210. But the real exchange rate is short, and then they fix it, completely fix it. But inflation continues to go at 30% per year. So the real exchange rate starts strengthening, and the price of copper tanks. This is nothing to do. And then there is a big crisis, and you can see the big devaluation at the end. And then there is, Peter Blair mentioned it this morning, then there is the, um, the period E, which is very pragmatic, and they do um, uh, in th uh, exchange rate targeting uh, with fiscal adjustment, and they, get, they privatize everything. So now the military don't own the, the, this was, of course, a very big political struggle, and now they are able to bring down inflation very slowly. And finally, uh, just after this ends in 1990, 1992, 93, Chile adopts um, uh, inflation targeting. It's one of the, after New Zealand, maybe the third country that adopts inflation targeting, and inflation starts coming down uh, very, very, uh, very slowly. Uh, but th this was a very, very serious uh, issue, and, 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 uh, and the crisis was very significant, and it created a rate of unemployment the, the rate of unemployment, this is why Milton was accused of almost genocide, went to 25%, that big peak in the rate of unemployment, that's after the, de the, the devaluation. And when Milton went for the second time to Chile, he's asked, do you support the fixed rate? There was, the current account deficit has been growing and it was by now 10% of GDP. And he made some statements that, it, 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 he didn't favor fixed, pegged rates like this one. He either said, you have a currency board or a floating rate. But these pegged by adjustable bread and woods rates, he really, but he didn't quite say it, and that's, his, he has been faulted about that. Well, so was Chile a neoliberal country? Well, in fact, if you th look at neoliberalism, and this is the first meeting of the MPS, there were MPS people, and yeah, the markets were used everywhere, and that's what generated the, the, the miracle. I mean, you don't get to being the number nine country in Latin America to being number one by not implementing really good wood skills. So the neoliberal, and I'm going to finish very soon, had, I think, the, the, the policy had five phases. It starts with cor correcting all the distortions from the socialist government and trying to bring down inflation, including the, the, the shock treatment that uh, Friedman um, uh, recommended. And then there was something that was called the seven modernizations. And this was put together by a very smart economist who had read that Mao Zedong in China had had four modernizations. And he went to Pinochet and said, General, the Chinese are doing four modernizations. I recommend that we do seven. <laughs> we have to outdo the Chinese. And the general said, that's a great idea. So the seven modernizations included private, uh, uh, individual private accounts for pensions, vouchers for schools, vouchers for um, health uh, services, um, uh, as I, I said, total privatization, lowering uh, import tariffs to 3%, and using markets as much. But they didn't, the one thing they didn't do was uh, privatize uh, uh, infrastructure or the copper company. And then the, there was, the crisis came, then it was pragmatic neoliberalism, they continued to privatize things, and then the left took over. And when the left took over, they finished the privatization process. And what's very interesting is that when the left takes over in 1990, they are elected, many of the newly elected leaders, members of the cabinet, have been in exile, have been in prison, and have been tortured by the military. And in spite of that, they maintain the model. And not only maintain it, they deepen it. And they say, well, they didn't say we are neoliberals, but they acted and they privatized the rest of the, of the firms, that, the companies that had not been, uh, been privatized. And that's what I called inclusive neoliberalism. And then the, 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 the model started to face diminishing returns and um, the rate of growth went from 7% to 5 to 4 to 3 to 2 
and people became unhappy. And there were riots in 2019. Oh, uh, Mild uh, Gary had a very important role in this whole process. Okay, and that's Gary with uh, some of the Chicago boys in Chile. And these are, so you, you, that's in Spanish, the first one. It says neoliberalism, this is a graffiti in 2019. These pictures I took personally. Neoliberalism was born in Chile and it will die here. That's what it says there. Right? And you see the military and the barricades and, and so on. This, what is this, this, Chile has been in the news the last uh, couple of weeks. So in 2019, uh, excuse me, the 2022, there was a, a constitutional assembly. It was decided by the politicians, we need a new social pact, we'll write a new constitution. And the far left won 80% of the seats in the assembly. And they wrote a constitutional draft that they had to submit to a referendum that was so extreme, so crazy, that after having won 80% of the seats, it was rejected by 65% of the people. And then we were trying again. And last Sunday, there was a new uh, um, uh, uh, election for the, the members of the second constitutional assembly. And now the far right won 60% of the vote, 62% of the vote. So the pendulum is going from the far left to the far. So how can you explain that? And I will finish with this. The only way to explain it is that the system hit, the, 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 the model hit um, decline, uh, diminishing returns. The rate of growth was significantly lower. Incomes, of course, were growing at a lower rate. But people's aspirations continue to be very high. And they, people con uh, got into higher debt in order to maintain their purchasing plans. And the indebtedness is what has made lots of people very anxious. And they tried the left, and what the left did, they were so crazy, they said, so now they're trying the ultra conservatives. And that may work or may not work. We're looking to see what happens. But the person that was voted the most is a very deeply conservative Catholic guy, lawyer, who is a member of Opus Dei, the very conservative, uh, Catholic uh, movement. He's a guy who um, has made uh, his, uh, how do you call it, uh, chastity votes. He, he lives with, uh, and, uh, he's never going to get married. And so, and so it's, it's completely schizophrenic, but it's very interesting. So you should keep, <laughs> keep on. So um, I will finish, John, there. And, and uh, I think that it's, it's an interesting case. And uh, those who got the book will enjoy it. And those who didn't get the book, Please get it. Thank you. <laughs> oh, the other thing, uh, see, before you speak, th that other one uh, up there, it says, of course, Ciao, Chicago Boys. You see the graffiti? Uh, so bye-bye, uh, Chicago Boys. N uh, no more neoliberalism. You know, this is, uh, Chile had an extraordinary policy reform that extended over decades that you just described. So can you give us, I got two questions that are both closely related. Can you give us some insight into the social and political circumstances that made it possible for that to come about? And the second question is why, given the picture you showed us of Chile's remarkable economic success, haven't other Latin American countries followed in its footsteps? Okay, so the first one, the, 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 the way it worked is why could it, it, why was it possible to do it? it because it was a very, strict dictatorship. And there were very significant, or so, political cost up front. And as you saw, it was very hard to bring inflation down. It was not a Poincare type of system where from one day to the another, next you had no inflation. And the shock treatment was very significant. And the exchange rate crisis brought open unemployment to 26%. That does not include emergency employment programs. People just cleaning, uh, just uh, cleaning the, the parks and so on. So it was possible to do it because of that. And when the pragmatic, the pragmatists took over and the exchange rate was finally allowed to fluctuate, uh, Chile took off and it started growing at 6%, 7%. And that's when the elections came and the, the left was elected and the economists from the left 
who had criticized, as John Lipsky was reminding me yesterday, had spent 17 years criticizing the Chicago police. The first thing they said is we're going to continue with these policies. So there's nothing more seductive than success. And they were able to see that things were, and they kept this system for, for many years. Now, why didn't other countries in Latin America follow? Many countries did. And the Chilean uh, pension fund system with individual savings account was adopted by Mexico. Uh, the Mexico Afores was adopted by Argentina, AFJPS. It was adopted by Peru. It was adopted by Colombia. So many, many countries adopted. Brazil is the one country that has been very reluctant. And the reason is that Brazil thinks, in some ways, with good reason, that they are very different. They don't speak Spanish. They are not as good at soccer as the Argentinians, but almost. <laughs> but every time I go to Brazil and I tell the Brazilians or, that, well, look at Chile, the, their answer is very simple. We export in manufacturing goods about two times Chile's GDP. There's nothing we can learn from a Mickey Mouse country. <laughs> that's a Brazilian answer. I mean, one way or another. But that's a, so Brazil hasn't, hasn't done it. Why did people get unhappy? One, problem that happened was that, um, well, let, let, me, let, me, let me say something. How do I summarize this whole Chilean story? How, that, that we went through this amazing miracle, and then it seems to be unraveling, and people are having revol a revolt and an insurgency. And I think that there was success and neglect. Success is this, and the neglect is that people like us, neglected defending the market system. We declared victory, we won the war of ideas, and now we can go and do our thing. And the Chicago boys joined boards, went to the private sector, and started making a lot of money. And who continued to fight the war of ideas? No one. And they didn't realize that the opponents leaked their wounds, regrouped, read Antonio Gramsci, the Italian uh, Marxist, and came back and convinced the young generation that this was a very unfair kind of system, that it was very unequal, and so on and so forth. So I think that one of the lessons is that we have to understand that the war of ideas never ends. Never ends. Thank you. Thank you, John.